Hey guys, welcome to another video. Today we are talking about this. Yeah. See that? Huge. Not exactly all of this, but specifically this little adapter that you probably don't see with this huge 70 to 200 IS2 Canon lens, but this little adapter allows you to take this huge lens, very nice, very sharp, very expensive, with image stabilization and use it on your GH4. Now I had a video probably about six to eight months ago on the Nikon version to Micro Four Thirds and I called it magic, amazing, phenomenal, all these crazy names. Why did I call it that? It's because it takes a larger lens, a Nikon, or in this case, finally, a Canon, takes all that extra light or most of the extra light like magnifies it down like you would with a magnifying glass, gives you one stop of extra light, and uh, because it gives you a wider image, you can uh, have like a wider angle lenses like the amazing Tokina 11 to 16, and at the same time, you can get closer to your subject, and by getting closer at a lower aperture, you have more shallow depth of field. Doesn't make it shallower depth of field, but because you have a wider image, you can get closer, thus giving you a shallower depth of field. Anyways, enough of that. This adapter, people have been waiting for for months and months and months. Ever since the GH4 came out, people are waiting for this, looking at all the other options, which basically sucked. Now we have the actual thing, and this adapter is an active adapter, which means you can actually see your aperture settings in the camera, and it supports image stabilization. So you can actually get this huge lens Put it to 200 millimeters at f2.0 equivalent as it shows up in here and you can record without getting crazy shake like you would um, i have a couple speed boosters that are the nikon versions um, i would never put a 200 millimeter lens on one of those and try to shoot with it no you guys will see the footage from this but with the ef to micro four thirds the canon version you could definitely do that so enough of me talking let's go ahead and look at some footage so here is some footage for you guys to see the sharpness. It definitely looks very nice, very crisp, especially if you're watching in 4K. Now this is at f5.6. I'm not going to show too much examples. I really want to focus on image stabilization. Uh, if you guys want to see more footage, I have a separate video that I'll link to at the end of this video, or you guys can check out the description for the link to that video on my channel. Now here is uh, some footage of the image stabilization. This is at 200 millimeters, and see, you do see some shake there but keep in mind this is a huge super heavy lens that I'm shooting at 200 millimeters by using that image stabilization it definitely looks better and if you can correct that in post it'll be nice look at this horrible mess right here this is 200 millimeters without the image stabilization turned on uh, I am not doing this on purpose this is actually what it looks like I'm actually trying to keep it steady and this shot here, same thing, I just got a little bit closer to give you guys another kind of example or look at it. Image stabilization turned on, you do have some handshake, but it's nice, and you can correct it to look almost like a completely steady shot in post if you want to. Hit that switch, this is what you get. Um, keep doing my best trying to keep it steady, but uh, you know, this is the best that I could do with the lens at 200 millimeters. Now I wanna show you guys a different example. This is at 70 millimeters with the image stabilization turned off. I did this clip backwards to kind of show you the difference between um, you know having it first be shaky and then be steady. So definitely, even at 70 millimeters, you still see a lot of that shake and I'm trying to avoid it here. Hit that switch one more time, image stabilization is turned on and it looks uh, really, really nice, really smooth, really natural. So image stabilization is a huge plus on this adapter. So guys, why is it such a big deal? Yes, you have the image stabilization that really, really helps. Yes, you have the extra low light, but why is this version such a big deal? Even more so of a big deal than the original version um, that came out with the Nikon lens that I have a couple of. The big huge deal is there's so many Canon shooters that are shooting with the 5D Mark II, 5D Mark III, 6D, um, other Canon you know, cameras that have a bunch of Canon lenses and that's the only thing that's stopping them from moving to let's say a GH4 or something else is there are huge amount of lenses that they don't want to sell. Now I for one did sell all my Canon lenses, I bought all Nikon lenses, I bought the speed boosters that are Nikon mount 
than the GH4. So a lot of people are kind of hesitant. Now what this is gonna do, it's gonna allow all those people to buy an extra body, a GH4 for example, be able to mess with that, be able to use all their cannon lenses, have image stabilization, uh, be able to just switch over and not hesitate so much. And uh, the other thing is, once again, it helps with the low light that this does not do so well in compared to like the full frame cameras. It definitely makes it much better in that way. So I think these are gonna sell like crazy. They're all sold out everywhere. Um, also, I think this is really going to push sales of the GH4 and probably other Micro Four Thirds sensors for people that are shooting video. Alright guys, so here's a closer look at the speed booster and the packaging. I will have a link at the end of this video and also in the description for an unboxing first thoughts and comparison video to the um, Nikon version of the speed booster. But anyways, the newer speed boosters come with not only this type of box, you also get a nice little case, which my Nikon version did not come with. So you have this nice hard case, a very nice clip right there. You have a little foam insert inside of there, and you have a couple tools. So that's really nice to have when you're spending this amount of money on something. You wanna make sure you keep it safe, especially with that nice optic right there. So one thing you do not get with the speed booster still is a manual. Now I know a lot of you guys don't read manuals. I typically don't. But in some situations where you don't understand everything or everything clearly, you want to look something up, it's nice to have the option. You don't get that. You don't get any manual whatsoever. So you basically get to go on their website. They have some information. And even then, it's not very clear. You would think on an investment that costs this much money, which is about 600 bucks, you can get some better answers. So one thing that I was kind of unsure about is this little rocker switch right here you guys see. You can go up, down, and you can push in. Now, I didn't tell, you know, I couldn't tell anything about it when I plugged that big, huge lens in there. It didn't do anything for me. Doing some research online, I found that this will do something called uh, like a wide open button, kind of like your camera would have on Nikon. So when you press that, it would, no matter what setting you have inside there, your lens would go wide open and then uh, you let go and it would go back. That didn't happen to me. So I don't know if it's depending on the lens or anything like that. So it's about all I know. I couldn't find any other info. So if you guys know some more about that, definitely let me know in the comments and I will add that into the description. But other than that, we have a little plug right here. I'm not sure if there's like a connector port down there. You have your lens release. You also have your little tripod foot here with a quarter inch jack that could be easily removed. And on this side, nothing, you just nice uh, smooth design. And of course you have your uh, front mount plate there. You have your electrical connections, that magnificent piece of glass in there. I will go ahead and remove this guy right there. And on the back, you have this back mount, which can also be removed. You see the screws there and your electronics connections right there. Now, one thing to note that this fits very, very nicely. It does have slight amount of play, but still it's nothing that is horrible at all. You can barely tell right there. When you compare it to the Nikon version right here, this has quite a bit more play. I will show you guys right now. Now connected to this Nikon, I have the wonderful Sigma 18 to 35, 1.8, which is fantastic. But I don't know if you guys can tell in the video, but it definitely is more play with this guy. Now, uh, Metabones has really good customer service, at least in my experience. And they actually sent me a couple more of these back plates so I can unscrew this and replace them with ones that fit tighter. I just have not got around to that yet. So pretty much the other difference between the EF and the Nikon version is this aperture control ring. The aperture control ring uh, that you have on here is very nice. It's de-clicked and it's more cinema style when you're controlling your aperture. You can get you know exact, exactly what you want as far as uh, the aperture, all the, everything in between, not like just by one stop uh, changes or third stops. So that's very nice. You do not get that with the EF. So uh, with the EF, you do get the image stabilization and you do get to see your aperture inside your camera, but you don't have the aperture controlling. So it's kind of up to you. What do you want? What's more important to you? Do you want to have image stabilization? Do you want to see your aperture exactly what it is inside the camera? Or do you want to have that declicked aperture uh, control ring to play with? It's kind of, you know, your choice, decide. You can't get both. 
I wish you could, that would be absolutely amazing, but you can't. One thing that you can't get on either one of these is autofocus. Now, even though this is uh, completely electronic, you do have the image stabilization, you have your settings show up in here, you do not have autofocus. I know they have it working on the Sony's, but on this one, I don't know if they just haven't unlocked it or what's up. Maybe we'll get it in a future firmware update. It would be nice, even if it's low, so that you could take photos or lock on to be, you know, before you do a shot. But we do not have this. Either way, still an awesome adapter. All right, guys. So one of the biggest questions that I received with my last video is how do you figure out your field of view, your aperture, once you're using one of these speed boosters with a lens. So regardless if you're using a Nikon version or if you're using a Canon version, they have the same exact optics inside. You gain one stop of light and then you also gain some width. It makes your lens appear wider. And you, so that is 0.71 width that you gain there. So basically, if you're using a 2.8 lens, it becomes a 2.0. If you wanna check out a chart online as far as your apertures, check that out and that's gonna help you find, figure out um, how much uh, more light you get basically or what the aperture change is with your lenses. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off with a Tokina as my example, 11 to 16 2.8 lens. Now this is a very nice wide lens. It is a zoom lens, but it's not a huge zoom, but what you get is basically an ultra wide on the 11 millimeter end or just a wide angle on the 16. So introducing the one stop, this becomes a 2.0, basically a F, F2 and then you have to convert the 11 to 16. So with this number, 0.71, uh, we can figure out what the widths are. So let's start off with 11. So we have 11 millimeters on the white end. So we're gonna go 11 times 0.71 equals, you have 7.81 millimeters. Now, I am not super smart. I figured this out ahead of time and I have it written down right here, just so you know, that's my cheat sheet. Okay, so you get 7.81. So now that's basically what the lens acts like on a like if you were be comparing it to a micro four thirds lens. Now what you do with this number is you have to introduce the crop factor. Now if you're shooting uh, 1080p, it's a standard 2.0 micro four thirds crop. So if we go times 2.0, you get 15.0. 62 millimeters. Now this is your full frame equivalent if you guys are coming from full frame. So you get slightly wider than like a 16 if you're using a Canon uh, 16 to 35 2.8. Now if you want, want to shoot 4K, that's a 2.3 times crop. So with a 2.3 times crop, you would have 17.96. So just slightly wider than 18 millimeters is what you're gonna get on the wide end there. Now we're, let's do the 16 end of it. So we have 16 times 0.71. This is the amount the lens gets wider equals out to 11.36 millimeters. Now let's introduce our crop factors. So shooting 1080, you will end up with a 22.72 millimeters. And if you're shooting 4K, which I almost always shoot 4K, you will end up with a 26.2 one two millimeters so basically guys so you have your uh, your lens rating you times by 0 0.71 to get it wider you get your kind of micro four thirds standard type rating for the lenses this is what you would see if you're comparing it to micro four thirds native lenses introduce your crop factors like you would with those native lenses and you get your equivalents this works with either speed booster and this works with all the other lenses uh, you know, if you're using any other, you know, Sigma, you're using a, a Nikon 50 mil, whatever you're using, that 70 to 200 that I'm using, this is the rating system. So basically your Tokina 11 to 16 2.8 turns out to be a 7.81 by 11.36 millimeter F2 lens. So that is a fantastic, fantastic setup. You can't get anything that wide and that fast. The closest thing that you have is your Panasonic 7 to 14 
f4 lens. Now this Panasonic lens goes for about 900, about 800, let me see, $850 used if you can find one. This Tokina, like I said, goes for about 400 bucks, even less sometimes depending on what deal you get. So look at the price difference, F2 compared to F4. Now you don't get the autofocus, but you do, uh, you, also, you also have a little bit less uh, range there, but F4 compared to F2 is really huge, and you have that price difference. Of course, you have to factor in the price of the speed booster itself, but you can use that with a lot of different lenses, not just kind of one lens. So it makes sense over and over again. So um, there's one example right there. Memorize those numbers, guys. You have one stop, 0.71. It's a very easy setup. I'll show you guys how to do that again. Now here's another lens that I would definitely recommend if you're going with the EF speed booster because of the IS. And anyways, it's a fantastic lens. It's a Tamron 17 to 50 F 2.8 lens. So we have a nice range. We have F 2.8, which is decent. Okay, so this is actually, let me pull this in. Here you go. I actually have one of these for an icon mount. It's not too expensive and it does the job well. I'll pull that away. So Tamron 17-50 f2.8 EF mount, and you want to go with a VC, which is vibration control. Actually, I think it's called VR, vibration reduction, something like that, guys. Okay, so we have 17-50, and 17, once you introduce the math, becomes 12.07. So you go 17 times 0.7 one equals 12.07. Now let's go with 50 times 0.71, which is the amount that our lens gets wider, will equal out to 35.5. And then that will become an F2, which because of the one stop gain that we uh, get there. Does these numbers sound familiar to you guys at all? Um, kind of sounds like the Panasonic, you guys guessed it, 12 to 35 f 2.8 very very similar setup now what is the difference that we have this tamron you can pick up right now on amazon for 350 dollars used that is with the vibration reduction uh, the panasonic sorry for my really bad handwriting you can pick up used for about 950 dollars if you guys can even find one. So look at that price difference there. Um, what I'm trying to say is if you guys go with this setup, you can factor in the cost of the speed booster, which is $600, if you guys can read my ugly handwriting, $600 speed booster plus $350 for a used lens equals how much guys? I think it equals $950, right? 950 bucks. You can either buy one Panasonic 12 to 35 f2.8 for 950, or you can buy a speed booster and this lens for 950 dollars. You get the same amount of range, you know, 12 to 35, and you get you know 12 to 35. Uh, you also gain a speed booster almost for free. I mean, you're paying for it, but you can use this with other lenses at the same time. And instead of having an f2.8 lens, you have an f2 basically an f2 lens and both of them have the image stabilization sorry guys this is my first time doing something like this so you have uh, f2 instead of f2.8 you gain that one stop you have is on both is what what people love uh, you don't have the autofocus guys so if you want to use it for stills you can't do it at least not with autofocus but still this is uh, kind of amazing kind of numbers that just hit my mind before making this video really really great setup i would recommend that lens one thing that you don't have is the panasonic has a little bit of kind of flashing if you're zooming in it's a constant f2.8 aperture but it kind of isn't because the aperture kind of shutters when you do that it's a known issue the tamron does not have that so that's one thing if you're focusing on video uh, that you'll benefit from going to tamron so hopefully you guys that helped you guys that math remember you gain one stop of light 
check out an aperture or the lighting chart and your lens gets 0.71 wider and that's the EF or the Nikon version. All right guys, so in conclusion, I wanna say that even though this is so amazing and I'm really excited about it, I'm not gonna be switching over to this Metabone Speed Booster just yet. It is mine, I don't know how long I'm gonna keep it, just because I have so much Nikon lenses, multiple speed boosters, native adapters, I have just all that stuff. It's gonna be really difficult for me to switch over, sell all my stuff, have my second shooter uh, sell his stuff, um, and just switch over completely. I may in the future when I have some more time and I'm able to do that, but for now I'm happy with that and I do like that aperture, the declicked aperture adjustment. But to all you guys that are coming over from Canon, this is gonna be fantastic. For you guys that have just maybe one speed booster, a couple different Nikon lenses, it'll be a lot easier for you guys to sell that and pick this up as soon as these are available. Um, but just to finish off, this is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm very excited. You guys can see the way I'm talking. Um, I know a lot of you guys have been excited. You guys are excited. You've been waiting for months and months. Uh, basically, I'm very happy that this is finally out. It's going to definitely boost the sales of the Speed Booster. So thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, uh, ask me in the comments. I'll definitely be able to, you know, I'll try to help you guys as much as I can. And if you guys uh, want to find this, I'll have some links in the description. If you guys use that link, it gives a little bit of kickback back to the channel. It helps support me. So if you guys want to do that, thank you. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Just do a Google search for this. Thank you guys for watching. Hopefully this video was helpful. Have a great day. Go and do some shooting, regardless if you have an iPhone or a crazy setup like this. All right, guys. See ya. Thank you.